on today's Technobabble. Eight Psychological Effects of How a Video is Made This is Tech No Babble, your weekly source for church video and graphics news, perspectives, tips, and tricks. And now, here's your host, Paul Clifford. Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another episode of Techno Babble. I am your host, Paul Allen Clifford, and I would love for you to join the conversation. So if you'll head over to trinitydigitalmedia.com slash contact, you can leave a message there, ask a question, uh, even make a snide remark. If it's too snide, there's no proof, there's no onus on me to publish it necessarily, but I'd love to hear from you anyway. So uh, head over there. You can also find all my contact information there. So my email address is paul at trinitydigitalmedia.com. You can also find uh, the voicemail number, one 763 or 1-877-POD-ECHO, same thing, to echo back to this podcast. See how that works? Okay, it's tenuous, I admit, but it works. Uh, also, you'll see, if you're watching the video, my Twitter handle, which is underneath my face here. It's Paul Allen Cliff. Now, remember, all three of those are spelled uh, the shortest possible way. So, Paul is, of course, P-A-U-L. Allen is A-L-A-N, and Cliff is C-L-I-F. Any fewer Fs, it wouldn't be Cliff. Any more, it wouldn't be the shortest possible way to spell it. See how that works? So, that's 12 characters, which is why I chose only that much. So, that is my Twitter handle, and that's where you can reach me. This show is sponsored in part by my pastor's book, What Life Are You Waiting For? It's still available for pre-order on Amazon, but the time to pre-order it and get the pre-order savings is quickly drawing to a close. Uh, at the beginning of next month, like uh, the first couple of days, is when it actually ships. So pre-order it today. Go to Amazon and uh, search for Pete Heiss, P-E-T-E-H-I-S-E. Or if you just want to go to trinitydigitalmedia.com slash whatlifebook or trinitydigitalmedia.com slash whatlife, uh, either of those should take you to it, uh, whatlifebook sometimes doesn't work so that's why I mentioned the other and uh, you can go there click on the link and that will take you directly to Amazon where you can pre-order it and save yourself some money I think you're gonna be happy that you did because this is gonna be a bestseller I just I have a feeling based on how many pre-orders that uh, we're doing and uh, how much we're doing to get the word out and so on, that this is just going to really, really blow up. And you'll be able to say, hey, I was one of the first people that got it. Technobabble is also sponsored in part by viewers like you. Thanks for helping out. Uh, the reason I'm using Patreon is it is the most convenient way for people like you to become patrons of the arts like this. In the past, only really rich people could do that, but this is the 21st century and everything is more democratized. So it, you no longer have to be independently wealthy. What I'm asking is if every viewer of this show, if every, um, if every subscriber to or every follower of my Twitter if everyone that reads my newsletter just gave one dollar a month one dollar just one then that would make some of the dreams that we all have possible we could have other talent on these shows experts in other fields like audio or lighting I've got uh, some people in mind that I'd love to call up and say, hey, because of the generosity of my viewers, I can now bring you on board as an expert to talk about your area of expertise so we can expand what we talk about 
we can expand the influence that this show has to impact lives and eternities. Because that's really what it's all about. It's not about using cool technology. That's just a side benefit. What it's about is impacting people. And you can help do that for just a buck a month. So go ahead and um, make that happen today. Okay, so let's get started talking about these psychological aspects of video. I think something that's been bugging me is a discussion I had where someone was choosing to do video in a way that is non-standard. What I mean by that is they were choosing to frame their shots in in a non-standard way. They were choosing just to do things in non-standard ways and saying, well, you know, I do what makes sense to me. That's fine, but doing what makes sense to you, you should know why you're doing it. The rules of video aren't created in a vacuum. It's not like someone sat in a room somewhere and just listed off all these rules to make things hard on you or so that you have all these things in the back of your head. No, no. These rules were discovered just as musicians made music first and then people figured out how they did it and that's called music theory or the language was spoken first and then someone decided, hey, I'm going to pay attention to pe how people use these words and I'm going to write a dictionary. You may or may not know that the dictionary didn't develop until the 18th century. So there were years and years and years where every word in the English language was only, <coughs> excuse me, every word in the English language was just defined by its usage. It wasn't later, it wasn't until later that uh, I think it was Ben Johnson in the 18th century decided to write down all the words and what people seem to mean by them. So a dictionary is not normative, it is normal meaning that you start with what people are doing and then you it becomes somewhat normative. It's becomes somewhat, hey, you're not using that word right. Uh, but that's how these rules of video are. And this is how the psychology of video works. It's not that it's inherently the case that the shutter speed affects how you perceive things. It's that people use certain shutter speeds to indicate certain things. And so by watching a lot of movies, you can start to pick up how they did them. And so that's why I've come up with this list of I think my wife gave me something. I uh, pick up this list of the these eight things that I've noticed uh, about the psychology of video. So the number one thing is, well, the first thing. These are in no particular order except as they came to me. Camera height determines the status of the subject. So, think back to your life. When were you looking up at, uh, when did you look up to people when you were a child? The people that you looked up to, and I mean literally, you were looking up. They tended to be adults who were telling you things and 
it was important stuff that you needed to listen to, etc. So, that was important to you. Now, you knew that you were shorter than them, and you knew that that's part of what made them adults, is adults are taller than children. That's really all you knew. Now, fast forward to your life now as an adult, assuming you're, you're an adult. If you're a teen, this may not really affect you as much right now, but it will in time. So, as an adult, the people that you literally look down on tend to be children. And so, while you might not think that you're more special or anything like that, that that's silliness, but you do know that you have more life experience than they do. So, when you're looking down on them, when they say something, you take what they say with a grain of salt quite often. From the perspective of a camera, if you have a camera that shoots just from below and up, psychologically that says this person is more important than I am. They have something that's important to say. Likewise, if you shoot from slightly above and down, that means subconsciously this person, what they're saying is not as important. When I worked in local news, one of the anchors wanted me to shoot down on her because she thought her eyes looked better. And I tried not to do that. I tried to shoot straight on or a little from below because I wanted her to appeal, appear more authoritative. Whether her eyes looked good or not, I didn't care. This this was news. This wasn't Hollywood where she wanted... she should have wanted to be the prettiest person. She should have wanted to have authority. So one thing I've seen a lot of churches make this mistake is they stick their camera in the balcony so they are shooting down on the pastor. When you shoot down on the pastor, when it's obvious that you're doing it, it's less of an issue because you could say, oh, well, they're in the balcony. But when it's more subtle, then you're basically handicapping your pastor's message. On some level, you're saying this, what they're saying is not as important. So keep it in mind as you're setting up your camera locations. Number two, poor framing can make the subject look distant, lost, crowded, like he sees something that you don't, um, like he has something on his mind, or is an amputee. So what do I mean by all those things? If you don't give adequate padding around the subject, they'll feel crowded. If you give too much, they'll feel distant. If it's a close-up where the, their eyes are on the lower third, it looks like there must be something going on in their mind for that to have all that space. There must be something important there. Um, if you cut a person off at joints, they look like they're an amputee. If you cut off a person at, at the neck with your framing, they will look like a disconnected head. If you cut a person off at the elbows, it'll look like they have no arm be below, their, uh, below their elbow. You see how that works? So if you're... Uh, if you don't give a person enough nose room, it'll look like they're looking at the edge of the frame, like they know that it's there. The frame is very powerful. The edges are very powerful. So use them wisely. Uh, number three, transitions tell part of the story. So if you use jump cuts, that is cutting between things without changing the shot enough to where it distracts the brain, then you think, oh, something is missing. And you can use that in telling a story, but keep it in mind that that's what you're doing. If you use cross dissolves, those tend to be change in either time or location, or time and location. If you use a fade to black, that 
that usually is a change of time. Um, so the transition tells part of the story. If you use a 3D cube spin, which you know is one of my least favorite transitions, basically what you're saying is, I don't know anything about video, which I'm sure is not what you're trying to do. Colors can subtly reinforce other elements. So directors in films do this all the time. In The Matrix, anything inside the matrix had a subtle green hue. Anything in the real world had a subtle blue hue. Do you understand? So the, the film was colored to look like that. In Vanilla Sky, when Tom Cruise, well, when his character, in the latter part of the movie, the coloring of the screen is a little more surreal than in the first part of the movie. Don't want to give things away. Trying not to do spoilers, but it's kind of hard with older movies. Uh, American Beauty, which I haven't seen in its entirety, but I've seen pieces of, has a lot of reds, whites, and blues to just have this wholesome, all-American feel, even though that's not what's going on at all. Um, so colors really matter. In number five, in two dimensions, when you're doing just regular 2D video or film, focus can guide the eye. <coughs> Excuse me again. Focus can guide the eye. And since the brain associates 2D with something that's not real, this works. Unfortunately, it, that's the only way that it works. So if we go on to number six, let me make a note of that. Number six in 3D, now I'm not saying everyone's going to be shooting 3D, but just keep this in mind as you're looking at movies that because 3D, when done well, seems so real, trying to draw a person's eye to something that's in focus versus something that's not confuses the brain. Perfect example of this is when I saw um, Avatar. Saw it in 3D, and there's a scene where the unobtainium, the mineral that they're looking for, there's a piece of that that's in the foreground and it's out of focus. I missed most of that scene because I was staring at it trying to focus on it. And that's a mistake. It should have been out of the frame or it should have been in focus. So you need a very deep focus for 3D. Otherwise it will confuse the viewer. Number seven, shutter speed affects realism. So start out with two times the frame rate. So if you're shooting at 30 frames a second, the shutter speed of 1 60th is a good baseline. You'll see that as normal. If you slow it down, say to 1, um, <coughs> um, if you show, slow it down so that uh, the shutter speed is longer, so in the old days, what shutter speed was, was how long the shutter would open up to expose the film to light. That, that's not the case anymore. With digital video, and etc., what it is is how long the sensor is active. So the longer the sensor is active, the more light hits the sensor, but also the more chance you have for motion blur. So when you get more motion blur, that seems more dreamlike. When you get... <coughs> I'm so sorry. When you get less motion blur, and in fact it starts to get a little staccato, it almost seems hyper-realistic. 
So Saving Private Ryan was shot where the shutter speed was a lot faster. And that made the battle scene seem hyper-realistic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Number eight. Position of lighting affects the subject's perceived goodness and truthfulness. Uh, lighting from below makes the subject appear unnatural and evil. Flat lighting, just because it, there's no drama there, it makes the subject seem truthful. Lighting like the lighting I have now where... <coughs> Excuse me. Where I have a stronger key than the fill is more dramatic. And the more pronounced the shadows are, the more dramatic that feels. So what I'm trying to do lighting-wise in my shot right now is I'm trying to kind of simulate what it would be like for me to be in the sun where the sun is hitting a side of my face and then there's a shadow on the other side. So I'm trying to make it somewhat natural, maybe a bit dramatic, but not crazy. If I wanted to go like television lighting, I would have like a more flat light where all of my face was very evenly illuminated. If I wanted to seem evil, I would light from the bottom. Because when that's so unnatural, you know, the sun is in the sky, not underneath. So it's so unnatural to see someone lit from the bottom that it just seems evil. This is actually a trick that Adolf Hitler's filmmakers used during World War II. I saw a propaganda film that had some of the outtakes and all. Um, someone was analyzing it and they were showing that with normal lighting the people that they were showing were uh, people with Down syndrome and uh, other unusual conditions. So with normal lighting, you, you kind of felt sorry for the people. They, they had some issues that uh, they needed your help. But Hitler's filmmakers, since part of what he was trying to do was quote-unquote purify, ugh, since what he was trying to do was justify the killing of people, that's what he was actually trying to do, they sh lit these poor people from below so that they seemed grotesque and evil instead of just like people that you really wanted to help out. So they influenced the audience's emotions by shooting from below to make them look grotesque and evil. When you see someone who's grotesque and evil, it's easier to persuade you that, oh, we need to get rid of this person, which is what they were trying to do. They were misusing the power of film for Hitler's evil purposes, using lighting. So just keep all these rules in mind. Keep these things in mind as you're shooting, as you're framing your shot, as you're lighting, as you're choosing your shutter speed, as you're deciding if you want a shallow depth of field or a, a, a more deep focus, etc. And I think that they'll really help you tell the story that you want to tell as opposed to realizing, huh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to I'm trying to document the story, but in fact what you're doing is you are distracting from the story. So the choices you make need to be in line with the story you're trying to tell, whether it's a true story or whether it's fiction or whether you're trying to tell a parable, you know, a metaphor, a metaphorical story. Any of those 
choices need to help dictate what choices you make psychologically. When you make the appropriate choices, you'll find that your videos have better effect. When you break rules, you should know why you're breaking them. And when you do that, that can also have great effect. But you don't do that haphazard. You don't do it just because you want to. You do it for very good reasons. And when you do all those things, that's how you go out and change eternity. Until next time, I'm Paul Allen Clifford with TrinityDigitalMedia.com.